Lord, everyone. Let's stand for a moment and let's dedicate our hearts to the Lord. <clears throat> How many know what day this is? This is the day. This is the day. We have several things going on here at our property. We have our church, obviously, our service here. Then we have a Spanish church next door. And then we have a Samoan church meeting as well. Um, after everything, we have a small Tongan fellowship, and we have AA, a Hispanic AA that's been here for many, many years. This is a busy place. Amen? And so I want to ask that the Holy Spirit would just cover all of us. <clears throat> so we have uh, three different languages going on here, plus tongues. How many speak in tongues? Okay, just checking. Amen. You say, well, I don't know if I believe in that. That's okay. That's all right. That's, you know, we'll ask the Lord to open your heart because it is in the Scripture, right? And the Bible says that uh, tongues uh, strengthens us. Amen? It strengthens us. And so even this morning as I was driving here, I, was, I began to bust out in tongues. I thought, I don't know why, but here we go. So... Uh, you know, the windows were up in my car, so don't worry. But let's pray for a moment. Father, we come into your presence this morning with an anticipation that you are going to touch each one of us at our particular point of need or particular uh, uh, place, Father, where we've asked you to come and minister in our own lives. But, Father, we pray also for those who are here and for those, Father, we pray for those around the world. Lord, as many have, have, uh, many have already worshipped you and have already gotten together in many places of our world, but there are still some left. And Father, we pray that you would cover this planet of ours with your presence. Lord, you said in your word that the earth is full of your glory, and so we pray that, Father. And we pray that for America as well, Lord. We pray for our country, for our leadership for the direction that the leadership is taking, for the church, oh God, that we would be a voice of righteousness, not reaction. We ask, Lord, that you would guide us as your people. And so this morning, we commit everything, Father, into your hands. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
tell him this morning, Lord, you are good. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your mercies. Thank you for your kindness that will follow us all the days of our lives, as it says in Psalm 23, 6. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. His kindness is forever. His mercy is forever. His favor is forever. Lord, we give you praise from our hearts this morning. Thank you. You are so good. Your kindness leads me to repentance. Your goodness draws me to your side. Your mercy calls me to be like you. Your favor is my delight. And every day I'll awake
draws me to your side. And your mercy, your mercy calls me to be like you. Thank him today. Your favor is my
this morning. Thank you, Jesus. You are good. And your mercy endures forever. We give you worship from our hearts this morning. My Jesus, my Savior, there's no one. There's no one like you. There's no one that compares to the promise that we have in Jesus. If you believe that this morning, just go ahead and open up your heart to the Lord and allow him to speak to you this morning. Thank you, Lord, for who you are to us. We give you our worship, Lord. We give you our praise. We put all things aside this morning, Lord, and we look to you, focus on you. Speak to us this morning. to 
Nothing compares to the promise we have. That promise will carry you through because it puts your vision not on what's happening but on what's, what God has promised to you. See, so many people walk around with, without a vision for life. With many people, life is nothing more than um, making sure that we get through today or that we have enough money or just very temporal things. And yet God says in His Word that without a vision, people cast off restraint. It's very important to have a spiritual vision and an understanding of your calling in God, right? Right? You know, how many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you are absolutely sure about your calling, about what God has called you to do, but that doing stems out of being, because a lot of us aren't being, but we're doing, <laughs> and that causes burnout, but if you're doing out of what you're being and who you are, does this make sense? You know, I make up my own words as I go, so never mind. <clears throat> that, you know, if, 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 if that's your existence, you're going to burn out. How many have been walking with the Lord longer than you ever thought you would? Come on, let me see your hands. For Okay, it's been 50 years for me. I know that there's maybe a few longer ones, but that's a long time. That's half a century that I've been walking with Jesus. And you know what? It's only because, A, it's His grace, right? Come on, I'm nobody. You know, in my weakness, he's made strong. Number two, number two, I forgot number two, but number two was good. <laughs> because I understand his, his, his calling to me. I do. I said yes a long time ago, and I've stayed the course, right? I haven't let any, anything or anyone Bounce me off the course. Offenses won't do it. People getting mad at me won't do it. Now, I'm going to stay. In fact, the madder people are, the stronger I become in Christ. So go ahead, devil, make people mad at me. <clears throat> I'm just kidding. But, but I know, and when I say I, I'm talking about those of us maybe. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt what God has called me to, to be. And so that gives me the opportunity to say no to good things because they're not necessarily his things. But all of that to say this, the promise of God. There are so many incredible promises in God's word. So many that you can take. Some of the promises are not maybe necessarily for you and for me. <clears throat> but there are those in here that are directly for me. In fact, the writers could have said, Jack, listen up. 
So, Father, I pray for each one here that we would begin to grasp that promise in our calling deeper than before. It's so good, Father, to, to walk with you. It's so good to follow after you. You know exactly the things that we need and even the things that we like. And so, Father, we, I, I, I just pray for those here in this room and <clears throat> those watching online that you would touch them, Father, in a special way. Touch us in such a way. Bring a revelation to us that there's no doubt that you've called us and also, Lord, that you've called us to something that is divinely suited for us. We give you praise. We give you praise, Lord. Would you raise your hands to him for a moment? Father, we raise our hands to you in adoration, in thanksgiving. We love you, Jesus. And Father, that now that we celebrate your post resurrection before you ascend into heaven I pray that you will guide us through the, the word this morning that as we look at some of these incredible appearances in John 20 that you would guide our hearts Lord as we read your word oh we may not see you physically as they did after your resurrection But Lord, you said to Thomas, blessed are you because you see, blessed, but more blessed are those who believe and haven't seen. And that's us. And so, Jesus, I pray, touch your people. We give you thanks, Lord. Everybody said amen. Amen. Have a seat. quick, uh, before I forget, um, can you throw the, the link up for the Institute? Um, discipleship Development uh, dot, dot org is our main page, but if, if, if you go to the, uh, uh, there's a particular link for uh, the discipleship decision, and that's, that's what we're doing this time, this time around, and if you're in that class, testing, is this too loud? It's good? If you're in the class, go ahead and read uh, the homework online. We have the QR codes on the, on the sheets that we handed out. <coughs> this time, this particular one is about a six-month class taught in one and a half hours. <coughs> Hello? How many of you are going to pray for me that I do it? <laughs> but we're also going to be talking about some of the most commonly misunderstood and mistranslated scriptures. <clears throat> There's a lot of stuff going on in churches and online, etc., and their, their preaching is not necessarily uh, very accurate because a lot of times we as preachers preach out of our own understanding. <clears throat> and so... Uh, it's important to, uh, to know what the Bible is really saying. So say this word with me. Ready? Exegesis. Exegesis. Say hermeneutics. hermeneutics. Okay, now those are two uh, theological words, or at least seminarial words, uh, that deal with uh, looking at Scripture from the vantage point of the writer. There's another word called eisegesis, which means that we read into Scripture what, what we believe to be true. And the Scripture was never created for us to read into. It's created for us to read out of. And so that's a real important task. That's a difficult task. Because we have to go back to what 
the original writer or writers were saying, to whom they were writing, and about what they were writing. You know, the one that's misquoted a lot in the New Testament, and obviously, is the Apostle Paul's writing. <clears throat> but there's a lot of scripture in here that people have just taken so, I mean, myself included. I, I, I come before the Lord and I say, Father, is what I'm saying, is this what you're saying? I don't care what they're saying on, 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 on the internet. I don't care what they're saying on TV. What are you saying through this, Lord? And you know, that sometimes I have to bounce it off of other people, not in, but I mean, I have to say, like, John Caprio, is this, is this, this is how I'm reading it. You know, is this, do you, is this what God is saying? And here's a, here's a common phrase that we always say. Ready? What does this scripture mean to you? Well, I don't really give a rip what it means to me. Because it's not about what it means to me. It's about what he's trying to say to me. Not what I think it means. So as, 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 you, know, as you can see, uh, this is going to be a tough night. <laughs> and uh, I hope you'll pray and uh, don't forget to come. Don't miss this one because this one's intense. And uh, no matter what, what it is, how many know that if, if you're a part of this class, oh, the enemy loves to trip you up and not come, you know, for all kinds of reasons. So just determine that you're going to come. And uh, we, we have uh, three more lessons, including this one, and then one final one, so four. Sorry, I'm adding one more. Is that okay? Now, missions. This, the last Sunday is usually uh, devoted to uh, at least a presentation or something about missions. We're doing a whole lot. And in, in the mix of all that we're doing now, we're also going to be sending John and Wendy to France, uh, hopefully as soon as possible. And, and I'm just saying what she's saying. You know. But uh, these two have been very, very instrumental in our ministry here in, in Riverside and through the years. And uh, they've gone through the thick and thin with us. Uh, a lot of thins and a lot of thicks. <laughs> but uh, it's going to be difficult to see them go. But, but although this may not be necessarily uh, exactly the kind of missions that, that we're focused on, it is a part of our, our overall missions, so, missions thing. And so uh, God has put it on some of your hearts maybe to support them, and I would suggest that, that you add it to your already existing missions giving and because uh, it's important that you uh, continue with what we're doing. Now, I just want to show you some slides. Uh, I don't have any, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a, a video. It's just a bunch of slides that I'll say next. Is that okay? So here's the first one. We are one team. I'm going to lean against this. Is that all right? We are one, I'm sorry, you have to look at my bald head here, but we are one team, praying, giving, going. How many believe in that? Yes. We are one team, whether you're praying, giving, or going. All three are important. And these are the, the ministries that right now we are somewhat involved in. So Native American Pueblo tribes, I'll explain later, Tibetans in Dharamsala, uh, Xining, China, and the Changtang in the Tibetan Bible, and then France. Next. I want you to pray for something. This is uh, not necessarily a missions outreach, but it's, I, I'm, I'm really soliciting your prayer on this one. Many years ago, about 30 years ago, in Flagstaff, Jane and I were pastoring Flagstaff, and we felt like that we needed to pioneer a church in a Mormon city called, or a Mormon town called Joseph City, all Mormon. Joseph City was the gateway for the Mormons in Utah into Arizona. And so the, the, the cemetery is full of very famous uh, people. This is a strategic town, an, an outpost is what I like to call it. So um, Jacqueline and, and uh, Rick Bick and I, Rick Bick, that's really his name. Um, we also in our church had a Dina Matina and a Martin Martin. I thought, what is going on here? But anyway, we, we went to pray, and we, we found, found this particular building in the middle of town. It was an abandoned uh, restaurant. 
And so we laid our hands on it. This is all Mormon now, and it's right in the middle of town on the main street. How many have been there for a minute? Let me ask, see your hands. So some of you have. Okay. So we laid our hands on it, and out of the blue comes a white dove and swoops like very close to us. And as if that's not enough, it circles and does the same loop. So I said, prayer answered, let's go home. So we bought the building, and our men in our church completely stripped it down to its bare you know, studs and foundation, and they rebuilt this whole little church. And we had a pastor, Wallace, who was a former Mormon and, and living in the town. And he's done a very good job for many, many years. But because of the pressures and because of things, he, he felt it was time to, for him to move, but there was no one to take the church. Now, I've been in contact with Foursquare, our district, and uh, they're thinking of closing this church. Now, I would like to ask you, let's pray that we don't do this. This is an all-Mormon town. It's the only non-Mormon church. There is no other church. It's all Mormon, a giant Mormon church. And the Mormon church there even owns this huge uh, 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 high school. It's a very strategic town. <clears throat> and so I'm going to go to bat. I mean, not because I'm, I, I'm, I'm emotionally and, and spiritually attached to this. I'm just saying, no, we can't. I, I don't want to be the pastor there, but uh, we can't let it go. We can't let it go. So I don't want to pray against Foursquare. Foursquare is my family, man. But I do want to pray that we all would hear the voice of the Lord. This uh, top picture is one of the many, many prayer journeys that we did to Joseph City. And this is an altar enshrined or, or a shrine uh, for Joseph Smith, <clears throat> who has been in this city. Or, or not Joseph Smith, but his uh, uh, family has been there. In fact, some of his family is buried there. So, so can we pray for a moment before I go on? Yes. Father, we thank you, Lord, for our Foursquare family and for our Foursquare leadership. And Lord, we ask that you would bring a special revelation about this particular small church. And Father, we pray that if it is your will, which I personally believe it is, but Lord... Lord, you can always adjust what my understanding of your will. And we pray for this, that we would be able to maintain ministry in this place, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, you know, the pastor that, that we used to pioneer this, was, his name is Rick Bick, and he lives in Iowa now. I've been talking with him and communicating with him, and he's very sad that this is going to happen. Much, many, many miracles happen in this place, he said. And now also, uh, Joseph City is, is actually using it once in a while as a little community building. And so when we dedicated this building, Don Long was our um, district supervisor, and we asked the, the bishop of, of, of this area, the Mormon bishop, to come and to say hello, to greet us. So he, he sat for front row, center, and it was an amazing day, amazing day, amazing, because we connected. You know, Mormons, the, their doctrine is cultic, okay? It's not correct. But that's, it's not about the doctrine, it's about the people. And we do what we can to integrate ourselves into the cultures. Amen? So, anyway, thank you for praying. Joseph Smith, I'm sorry, Joseph uh, City. So, uh, thanks for praying for that. We have a ministry to Hopi, Zuni, Hamas, and once in a while in Navajo, or we know a lot of Navajo people. And so this is one of the villages, and we are going to, I'm, I'm continuing to uh, uh, think about what to do there. We have a, a ministry, next slide, we have a ministry called Adopt an Elder, where we take the older people who can't, or who really need something, and, and we bless them. And we usually, it's usually around $1,000 a pop for things. And we, we bless them uh, with things that they need and just let them know we have a special certificate that they are, uh, are the elder of, of, of you know, this time, of, of Adopt an Elder program. And 
Uh, man, I'm telling you, the Lord told me to do it to Thelma, Shishi, and Zuni. And I procrastinated, and finally I did it. I sent it. And man, she was so, so appreciative. And then a week later, she passed away. See, so that's important that we do this, amen? Just to encourage them. They've got to find a way to bridge it. And usually you bridge it with some kind of a, a, a need that they have. Now, we're not trying to be, you know, Amway sellers or anything like that. I'm just saying that that's not why we're making the, the relationship. We're making the relationship. They are and we are because we love them. And in, in hopes that God would open up an opportunity for us to minister to them. Amen? Next. Touching our world with practical acts of God's love. If you want to go and see more, um, you can do this website here. Hopi.org is about the Hopi tribe. That's our website. But this one has uh, everything that, almost everything. We, I don't have anything about the Bible on that particular website. But uh, you can uh, check it out. Thank you. Amen? Thanks, you guys. Jane, could you give me that water for a minute? Sure. Turn to John chapter 20 for a moment. We're going to talk about something that's going to be hard to do in a few minutes. Yeah. Brad and Olivia, you up there? You ready for a new, new edition? <laughs> They're going to have a baby when? Soon? First week in May. Do we still need to continue praying? Okay. Ladies, pray for her. All right? Um, can I say? Yeah, the baby is up, what is it? Wrong side, right? Breach. I don't, I've never had one, so I don't know. Breach. So ladies, go to prayer. Go to prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray right now, Father. We ask that you would do a miracle. Do a miracle, Father, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Then Zach and uh, his family, you guys are moving when? May 16th. We'll pray for them before they leave. Uh, we'll give them the boot, spiritual boot. And uh, they're going to uh, the rural country. Where is it? West Virginia? Or? West Virginia. Yeah. You look the part, but you don't sound the part yet. So. <laughs> oh, absolutely, y'all. Well, Father, as we look at chapter 20, we ask for your guidance, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know what to do. Uh, no, nah, that's not true. I do know what to do. But this is an amazingly intense chapter. How do you think you would react? How do you think you would react when you've seen him on the cross, a bloody mess, he was taken down dead, placed in a borrowed tomb, and the stone sh uh, rolled across and sealed by the Roman government. To all of a sudden go, and remember last week we talked about the angel who descended, created this giant earthquake, and sat on the stone. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, that, 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 that'll preach. This angel sat. It just meant that, you know, take that devil. Yeah. Conqueror, sit down. You know, Jesus went, ascended into heaven and sat down. It's a, it's a scriptural illustration of conquering. Job done. 
But this one, this, this, can I just start reading and see how far I go? Because, <clears throat> I mean, pretty much you have to read the whole chapter because those, but I'll do my best. You know what, as I read, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to go ahead and comment on these things. Is that okay? Good. Never learned how to preach. Because I didn't want to. I didn't want to learn how to preach. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Because what I do is not preaching in the... In the in the Christian culture setting. I like to hear from God. I'm not saying anybody else doesn't. I'm just personally. I, I can't say anything unless I hear from God. And he's never let me down. He's never let me down. Ha, does anybody remember in the 23 years here, has there ever been a Sunday where I said, well, you know what? I really don't have anything. No, it's usually the other way around. You know, how many want to be here until three? <laughs> you know, kind of a thing. So early on in the first, uh, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, I mean, these are, this is incredible uh, um, picture that, that we can see. And I want you to start using your imagination, not to imagine things that aren't there, but begin to take these words and, and put yourself into the, in, you know, in, into the story. Put yourself there. It's dark. So what time would that be here now? No, it's, it's not. Four o'clock in the morning, let's say, right? Four o'clock in the morning. So at four o'clock in the morning, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone, that the stone had been removed from the entrance. First of all, her name is Mary Magdalene. The word Magdalene is actually uh, in reference to the city where she's from in Galilee. Her name is Mary. There are several Marys, and it's a little bit confusing. And a lot of preachers have preached that she was a, a prostitute and a sinner and all that stuff, and especially when uh, taken from some of the parables and, and Jesus having, having a, a supper at uh, Simon the, you know, Simon's house in Luke, and uh, there's a woman that comes, and, and she cries and washes Jesus' feet with her, with her tears and with her hair, and, you know, there's a big uproar and everything, and that's not her. That's not her. That's another woman. This Mary was actually <clears throat> probably well-to-do, well-off, because she was among the women who supported financially the ministry of Jesus. Plus, to make it even... More exciting, Jesus had cast seven demons out of her. The Bible says in this particular uh, uh, story that I just referenced, there's a parable that Jesus tells the, the homeowner. And he says, uh, Simon, if uh, somebody's been forgiven of much, uh, what do you think? Well, they would love much. If you've been forgiven of much, you love much. If you know where you've come from and you realize the miracle that Jesus did in your life, it's going to be hard to say no to him. That's her story. She was a devout disciple of Jesus. And isn't it interesting, with all throughout history, with all of the, of, of the, of the nonsense that cultures have done to squelch women. Entire cultures have placed women in second place. Scripture and verse. God never created women to be in second place. Well, yeah, it says in Genesis chapter, you know. No, it says a help equal to. Jane is different than me. But we are equal. In fact, I want to kind of be like her when I grow up in some areas of my life. I don't mind that she would take the church. 
I'd rather have her do it than anyone else, you know, because I trust her. But she's, she's fully submitted to me. And I don't mean that in a woman, you've got to submit. No, 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 no. You know, we, we get that, uh, here I go off on some rabbi trail again. But, uh, uh, you know, yeah, thank you. Ephesians chapter 5, you know, it talks about the, the, the husband and the wife, right? It says that women are to submit to their husbands. So we think that that's, we have one picture in our, and I'm not talking to anybody. I mean, we, you know, there's all kinds of emotions and feelings about women. And so this is my opinion, all right? But I, I think that I have the word behind some of this. But that word submit in Ephesians 5, dealing with the, the wife submitting to the husband, is the exact Greek verb or Greek word that in chapter 4 at the end says to submit one to another. Okay, I'm getting loud. That's, are you okay? That word submit in chapter 4, to submit to one another, is exactly the same word that the wife should do to the husband. But it doesn't say that the husband should submit to the wife. You know why? Because he's got to die. Thank you. I'd rather submit than die. <laughs> Are you okay? Are you all right? You can say, well, do you have an agenda here this morning? Well, absolutely I do. My agenda is to bring the word. And uh, uh, along with the word comes my own personality. Anyway, thank you for being who you are. That's very exciting. <laughs> Jim, you've known me for a long time, right? I haven't changed too much. Because I, I, I just... You know, I, I need us, I need to hear the word the way that Jesus intended it to be interpreted. Yes. Thank you, Lord. And with this particular scripture here, I see the high regard that Jesus had for women. Amen. He wasn't afraid to surround them, himself with women, Amen. disciples. How many come from a home where uh, all you have is female? Guys, I'm talking about guys. Come on, am I? Okay, one, two. In, you know, in my house, three. In my house, uh, it was all female. My, my daughters, my wife, all my pets. <laughs> Everything was female. So I don't have a problem with women. They, they don't intimidate me. Well, maybe Wendy, but, you know, <laughs> kidding. And so she ran to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance, verse 2. So she came running to Simon Peter. She went back to the disciples and the other disciple. Who is the other disciple, incidentally? How do you know it's John? Because he wrote the book. He, he, he wrote this letter. And so instead of calling himself John, he called him the other disciple. That's John in this book. <clears throat> and said, in fact, the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. Boy, isn't that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just kind of clicked on that one here. You know, he's writing the book, right? He's writing the letter. And he says, you know, Peter went with me and the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, <laughs> you got to read through some of this stuff, okay? You got to read into it a little bit. <clears throat> you know, it's like, can you imagine being in the family? You know, Jesus loved me more. We sent our grandkids some money, and we gave Jeremiah a little bit extra because he's older. Boy, he milked that puppy, I bet. <clears throat> They've taken the Lord out of, out of the tomb. And we don't know where they've put him. So she has no clue yet of what had happened, even though Jesus said he would do this. 
So Peter and the other disciples started <clears throat> for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple, who's that? <clears throat> John outran Peter, because he was younger, and reached the tomb first. <clears throat> he bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. <clears throat> then Simon Peter, who, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there. Notice this verb first. As well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. <clears throat> Finally, the other disciple, John, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. He saw, what did he see? The cloth had been folded and believed. They still did not understand. You know the story behind that? It's a Jewish custom that a master, before he ate, you know, the meal was prepared, and the servant would uh, prepare the table, etc., and the master would eat. And as the master maybe had to, to go somewhere, and uh, I don't have a, I don't have a napkin, so, so let's just say this useless piece of, I'm sorry, this thing. Let's say it's a napkin. If he did this to it, if he folded it and laid it next to his uh, plate, it would mean that he was not finished and he was coming back. This was a custom. Every Jewish boy understood this custom. And so the servant had to wait, and when he saw the master put, it, put this napkin like this, next to his plate. He wouldn't clean up his plate because he knew that the master would come back again. But if he did this, when he was finished, he would wipe his mouth, his beard, and everything, and he would take this and throw it down. The servant would understand, now is the time to do it. But if it was folded, he dare not touch the meal. So, Years ago, years ago, when I was still a young Christian, I, I, I looked at that and I said, why? What? What does that mean? So I made up my own meaning, you know, I kind of Jesus this thing. And I said, well, you know, maybe he was just toying with it because, you know, uh, when I used to have sugars in my tea and I would have a lot, the packages, I would uh, tear the top off and then however many packages I would use, I would fold them up and put them in this particular one, and I would twist it. Right, Jane? So anytime you would see a meal with the sugar things twisted, I was there. You know where I'm going, right? And so Jesus, you know, I thought that maybe he did that to the way that I twist these things, you know, just say, look what I did. You know, I was here. But there's such a deeper meaning to that. He was actually saying something. In fact, the Bible, the Bible uh, uh, uses an entire verse about this folded napkin. So it must be significant. The significance of this is that when Jesus rose from the dead, it was his way of saying to the disciples, I've come back. I'm back again. He was also saying, I'm not finished yet because he still had to go up. But it was his way of telling the disciples, still here. And so when they looked in and they saw, they believed. Isn't that amazing? What do you need? What, what does Jesus need to do with you so that you will believe forever? You know, in a, in a, in a little bit here, we're going to talk about Thomas. And what, an, what a bad rap Thomas had throughout history. He's always been called what? Doubting Thomas. Dude, let's, let's, let's ask forgiveness for that sin. Because I'm going to tell you in a minute why he shouldn't be called Doubting Thomas. Incidentally, Thomas went further than anybody else went. Do you know where he ended up in his, in his travels? And he was martyred in Kerala, India, you know where that is? About as south in India as you can go. 
That's where Doubting Thomas went. Okay, let's keep going. <clears throat> the cloth was folded, verse, verse 8. Finally, the other disciple, uh, he saw and believed. They still did not. So let's do verse 11. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. So the disciples run back. Um, they all run up. They see, they believe. They run back, and Mary stays. There's a story in the Old Testament where Moses and Joshua are in the presence of the Lord, and Moses leaves, and Joshua stays. There's something about staying. There's something about not going out too early. There's something about not just, you know, okay, we're done, bang, gone. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about the service. I'm talking about, because God may want to do something long uh, after you think you're done. And so Mary stayed. And she was weeping. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. If these two guys would have stayed, they would have seen these two angels as well. But instead, Mary stayed, and she was able to see the two angels. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. You know, you think, well, why not? Well, remember now, her last picture of Jesus was a piece of raw meat. And now he's in his glorified body. Now there's a difference. <laughs> right? That's a huge difference. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was. Verse 15. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. I rebuke every lying spirit that has perverted this relationship. Do you know what I'm talking about? I rebuke the perverted, lying spirits that have taken this relationship and perverted it. Things like the Da Vinci Code and other saturated YouTube videos have made a mockery out of this relationship and perverted it. How could Jesus have a sexual relationship with a human woman? You say, well, Pastor Jack, why, why? No, that's out there. Entire books and movies have been made. And I rebuke that. I don't accept that. I absolutely stand against that. Satan couldn't touch him at the cross, so he wants to smear him after his resurrection. Anyway, soapbox time. Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, don't hold on to me. She was going to hug him. For I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. She had the privilege of seeing, being the very, very first person on planet and in history to see the resurrected Jesus and to have him talk to her and say, tell the other guys. You know, there's, since Genesis chapter 3, there has been such a powerful delusion against women on the planet to make them second-class citizens that this particular event here 
elevates them to a higher place than ever before. Because Jesus is not of the persuasion, ladies, that you are second to the men. You don't do what we do, and we don't do what you do. But that doesn't mean we're, there's, there's the whole, oh, I can't go into it. But there's entire cultures where, you know, I'm the head and you're, and then she says, okay, you may be the head, but I'll be the neck and I'll turn the head. Because whenever you, you establish this kind of authority in a marriage, you, 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 you foster rebellion. I don't tell Jane she's, you know, I don't tell her, well, I'm the head. You know, I'm not Jackie Gleason of the Honeymooners. I'm the king of the castle. I never forget that. You know, what, watching that thing, you want to just jerk the dude right out of the television, you know? <laughs> or shake her, man. Get, and what's the other one? Archie Bunker. Archie Bunker. That, boy, that, that, that particular thing opened up a lot of eyes. It was disgusting, but it, it was required to open up the eyes of all that stuff. Verse 19. On the evening of that first day, this is still the first day, okay, of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. I actually should read it. With the doors locked for fear of COVID, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. <laughs> you know why he said that? Because they freaked out. I mean, he, he just, doors are locked, and here he comes. Like a beam me up Scotty thing, you know what I mean? Just kind of materializes in front of them. And he says, Peace, it's me. Gosh, I'm sorry. Anybody get that? that how would you like to be? You know, you're, you're in your house. You're afraid of the Jews. The doors are locked, right? Nobody can leave and nobody can come in. And all of a sudden, here comes Jesus. I mean, like he materializes right in front of you. What would you do? You're a little late. I'm telling you, it's miraculous this whole week. And he said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Where is he sending them? What's he sending them to? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we, 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 we read about... Uh, 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 is it 1 Corinthians 15? But we read about the, the ministry of reconciliation. We have the ministry of reconciliation. You know what that means? That we have the authority to reconcile a fallen world to God. We have the responsibility of being the face of Jesus to this planet. We have the, the, the incredible opportunity to be Jesus in this culture. And so how does this culture see us as Jesus? What's their interpretation of Jesus after they see us? Do they see us as a Bible-thumping, legalistic, going to hell, burning group of people? Or do they see us as, as people who truly and genuinely look beyond their sin and their, their, their stuff and still love them. I can't finish it all, so. He said, and then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you, have, if you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, 
Listen, if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Wow. This reminds me of the, of the, uh, the commission that God said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. This is those that, you know, you, you can read it. Now Thomas, verse 24, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Why was he not with them when they were hiding in the, in the room with the door locked? Why was he not there? <clears throat> he wasn't fearful. He was out and about. They were all huddled, shaken in their boots, door closed. Hey, hey, shut the, shut the blinds or see us. Close the windows. You know, and they're, they're freaking. Aren't you glad that Jesus still comes to us when we're completely freaked out? You know? He still comes to us. And so Thomas shows up. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. <clears throat> A week later, his disciples were in the house again. And Thomas was with them, probably bringing them some food because they were afraid to leave. And through the doors, though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, because see, see, Jesus heard what Thomas said, even though he wasn't there. And he went right up to Thomas. He went right up to Thomas. Thomas, yes? Put your hand here. Right here. Put it. And Thomas didn't even have to put his hands in there. And he fell to his knees and said, I believe. <clears throat> now, let me ask you something. Is that doubt or is that a genuine, honest answer? There's a difference between honesty and doubt. Doubt says, yeah, but. He just outright said, I don't believe. I'll not believe until I see him. There is no doubting about that. He just full on said, I don't believe. And Jesus honors that. He doesn't honor doubt, because those who are doubting are like the waves of the sea tossed here back and forth. Thomas was not tossed back and forth. He was on this side saying, come on, really? You guys have been smoking something. Well, they didn't do that back then, but maybe they did. <clears throat> and when Jesus came, Thomas was there the, the second time. And Thomas believed. And Jesus says something very profound here. He says, Thomas, put your finger here in my hand, etc. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are, this is not a rebuke to, to Thomas. This is a, a statement to us through the ages. Because you have seen me, you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. There it is. In red and white, there it is. Hallelujah. Jesus said that we can be blessed if we, are, if we believe even though we have not seen. So, as I said earlier, here's this guy that doubts, right? Everybody's labeled him the doubting Thomas. But you know what? Nobody has called the other ten disciples the fearful disciples. They were afraid. Why don't we call them the fearful bunch? Instead, we call Thomas, even in Sunday school, we, we shouldn't teach our kids, this is Doubting Thomas. His name was Thomas, one of, the, one of the twins. He was a twin. In fact, he so not doubted that afterwards, as the scattering came in Jerusalem, Acts, Acts 6, 7, 8, 9, etc., as the scattering came, he scattered not to the other areas, but he went down south and down through and ended up in India. That's amazing. They have a whole denomination of Christians in India that are 
honoring Thomas. He's my hero. He's my hero. Why? Because he was so stinking honest. He said it. He just said it. Boom. And I, I, I admire that. Because too many times we, we say and... Yeah. You know, I can look through the, the church here and I won't point you out, but you know, I, I never have to guess what you're, what, what you're thinking. Right? You can be that way. You know, I mean, it, it borders on being the critic, but still, you know, you, you can be that way. You, you can be honest in such a way with each other that people will actually admire you for that. I'm not saying that you, you know, take a cat and go cross. But you can be honest. And Thomas, I would probably, if I was going to label him, label him as honest Thomas. What label has been placed on you? What label have people put on you? If it's not fitting, don't submit to it. If, if, it's, if it's not you, you don't have to submit to it. Here's the kind of label that you should strive for. What would people call you at your funeral? Faithful, honest, persistent, optimistic, you know, rather than Boy, this guy was a mess. <laughs> or he was always grouchy. Change the label that's on you. Change it. You say, well, I've always grown up with the perception, this perception that people have of me. And so how do I change it? How do I change it? Well, don't act that way. Right? Don't act that way. Are you okay? Are you all of a sudden mad at me? No? You're good. <laughs> when it's quiet, it's like, especially when arms get folded, you know. No, I'm kidding. Right, Bernie? I'm kidding. You know, what, what label? I mean, how do you perceive things? How do you perceive people, you know? Perceive people, look at people with a Biblical label upon them. You know, Debbie just had surgery. She's here. What are you, nuts? You know, I, I wouldn't have been very mad if I... No, I'm just... But you're here. Why? Because you're... This is a lady who's a determined warrior. She may not be as vocal as others... Right? Amazing. So I, I, I want to encourage you. Uh, Easter's not over. I like what you said, John. It's like, it's not over. Okay, Easter's not over. In fact, even when he ascends, Easter's not over. In fact, it's never been Easter. Easter comes from Ashtart. It's resurrection. And he's resurrected, period. Now for the next, listen, for the next 40 days from last Sunday, for the next 40 days, he's going to be on earth appearing and in different ways. He's going he's to meet him on, on, on the edge of the Sea of Galilee and he's going he's to be cooking fish and feeding them. You know, I would have really liked to have seen him that he just cut the fish open and they started eating, like sushi. But, oh well. You know, and, and, and then there's the two disciples. That's probably next week. The two disciples, my two friends, you know. They have no clue who this guy is. And Jesus kind of toys with them a little bit in a, in a fun way, you know. But when they heard the word, their hearts burned. Burned. Because they heard the word. 
And finally, he ascends into heaven. Two angels, you know, the whole thing. And then they wait 10 days. They're only together in, in the upper room for 10 days, a little over a week. It's not that much. And, and they atrophy to about 50%. Because people have a hard time waiting. Like these guys. Mary waited. They went home. These guys, when the ones that, when you wait, when you decide to wait, you will experience things that no one else will because they didn't wait. I want to wait. I want to dump the label and I want to wait. Let's stand for a moment, can we? And as I look around, probably everybody knows the Lord and somebody asked me, how, how come you don't do uh, uh, salvation altar calls? And I said, because you're, you're saved. If, if my altar calls, if I would have altar calls, it would be, you know, get with it. <laughs> get with it calls, yeah. Appreciate you, and I thank you. I hope you got something out of this story. <clears throat> I, uh, I don't always... <clears throat> I just, uh, I love to make the Bible come alive. I love it. So, Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks, Lord. Father, Jane and I give you thanks for this incredible body of believers at Christian Life Center. And, Father, all those that watch us online, we bless you in the name of Jesus. We bless you in the name of Jesus. You may be in town or out of town, but we bless you. Thank you for being a part today. And Lord, we commit this following week into your hands. Lord, I pray that you would make the stories of the post-resurrection, Lord, more real to us than ever before. All culminating, Father, on the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which actually is the beginning. And so, Father, it blows us away that we're part of such a rich, incredible divine heritage. And I pray, Lord, for your people. Lord, we pray for the body of Christ here in America. Forgive us for reaction. Forgive us for anger. Forgive us, Lord, for divisiveness. Forgive us, Father, for for um, uh, pulling people to our own ministry and pulling people out of other churches to attend their church. I ask your forgiveness for that. But more than that, Father, I pray that there would come such <clears throat> a spirit of revival upon the body of Christ that we would not be like the, those disciples behind closed doors, fearful. That would, we would be bold and mingling with our culture. And so we give you thanks, Father. We give you praise. The Lord bless you all. We'll see you next week. Amen? Amen. Amen.